This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we're talking with national champion and board member Melissa Copeland. She's the 84 plus Masters national champion who finished second at the World Championships in 2022. We will talk to her about powerlifting as a 40 something, her role on the board with Powerlifting America, and her injury and comeback from that at 2022 Worlds. Before we start, don't forget that we've got sub junior, junior, masters, and equipped nationals starting June 2nd. And a week after that, it's the biggest stage in powerlifting at Classic Open Worlds starting June 11th in Malta. They will both be streamed live and we'll post the links in our Instagram story at powerlifting underscore America. So make sure you're following us there. Thank you to SBD and Alika for their continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com and become a member. Now let's get to this interview with Melissa Copeland. What's up? I'm here with Amy Hutchison and Melissa Copeland, Masters World Athlete. Um, and this is the Powerlifting America podcast. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Cool. I'm Amy, but Melissa's the important one today. So. <laughs> Um, I'm not, but okay. Uh, I'm Melissa Copeland. Um, I am a Masters 184 kilo lifter and the reigning national champion. So give us a little bit of information background as to what your role is with Powerlifting America too. So what's your current role and what does that look like? So my, my current role with Powerlifting America is I am one of the co-chairs with Ellis McLean of the athlete committee. Um, we've only just stood that up, gosh, about a month ago. So we've had like two meetings. Um, <clears throat> we're really trying to set the agenda for, um, kind of issues we want to get after, uh, this year to help support all of our athletes and members. Um, we want to make sure that we are a resource for everyone. Um, so answering questions, um, having meet experiences being better, um, all of that, our, our purview is actually pretty broad, which is a little scary. Um, but I think the big takeaway is that we are here for the lifters. I just want to be a fly on the wall with you and LS just hanging out, like just hanging out. I want to, I feel like that would just be a great conversation. Y'all must have a lot of fun. I mean, if you want to stalk us while we're in Scottsdale, there's going to be, meetings, I will so. totally, I'll just totally. be the like right. over. Yeah. <laughs> So what do you think y'all's biggest focus is right now? I would say right now, probably the biggest focus is uh, athlete experience at meets, right? Um, because we're a small organization, because we don't have a lot of meets, um, we really want to make sure that the meets that we have um, are good, good meets where the experience is good um, and where things are done consistently, like not just within, like obviously everyone's following the rules, but also that we're kind of turning out consistent product, um, which also in addition to making sure it's a good experience for the athletes also means making sure that the meet directors and the referees have the resources they need to help make sure that this is a good experience for everyone. Um, and then the other one that I think is high on our list is just inclusivity overall, right? So um, discussions have been had about special Olympics and para powerlifting and like right where I am, I am, I'm right up the road from Walter Reed. So we've, we've had wounded warriors and that sort of thing, um, at all, at some of our local meets, like how do we make sure that we are incorporating those groups into the larger community so that they feel like they're, they're part of our organization. Um, and, and making sure that everyone feels like they're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And local meets definitely are, they're challenging because meat directors kind of have their own way of doing things sometimes, their own goals in terms of what they want to see out of their own meat. Um, mm -hmm. But you also want to make sure that there's kind of a minimum standard too. So, right. Um, so that's, that's challenging. I love um, what Ben is doing in Buffalo is crazy. Like they're, mm -hmm. they're doing some really good meets up there um, that look really, really fun. So I'm, I'm glad that you're providing those resources for athletes to have a really good experience too. We're trying. So what, <laughs> yeah, what would that look like? What kind of resources would that look like? Uh, so, and I can't take any credit for this because I've never been a meet director. So, so a lot of this was coming from LS's experience as a meet director, but mm -hmm. you know, we're a young organization. We don't have a ton of membership. So 
we have a lot of new meat directors and there are things you just don't think about if you've never run a meet. Mm -hmm. So like, what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the things that you need to think about? What are some of the lessons learned by our more experienced meat directors that will set a, a new meat director up for success? Because in addition to being successful for the athletes, if a meat director has a terrible time and they're like, never again, mm -hmm. that won't help us either. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And those random things like you need duct tape, <laughs> like who would have thought right. you need duct tape. Things that you never thought about, like, oh, I didn't, I didn't print out attempt selection cards and Kinko's doesn't open till 10, but lifting is supposed to start at nine. Well, that's, that's going to be a problem for us. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what do you do when, when you can't get next lift or not next lifter, um, good lift to work? Like, because there's always, always technology problems. Like, what do you do? How do you keep it together? How do you keep things moving? How do you train your spotters and loaders? Um, we, even though we're a small organization, we have a, a ton of knowledge. We have people who've been mm -hmm. doing ever. So we want to be able to leverage that so that people don't have to necessarily learn all these lessons for themselves because someone else already learned it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we were talking the other day about all those random things that come up in terms of rule book too, where you go, I never would have known that this rule was a rule. Right. If this hadn't happened at a meet that I was at. Um, I right. had those more experienced refs or those more experienced, um, I guess, members be mm -hmm. a part of that conversation and say, oh, well, the last time this came up, well, the last time was 10 years ago. How would have ever seen that happening? Right. Yeah. And like, so we had a wounded warrior to meet that was like, okay, we have to do weigh-ins. Oh, okay. Like there's a process. How? Yeah. Right. We, none of, nobody there had ever done it before. So it's like, oh, yeah, to the rule book. Uh, <laughs> so it really is sorting that stuff out and being better educated. Mm -hmm. And y'all are doing a lot of meets in DC area right now too, right? Or yeah, I mean, you. we're still in Maryland, but like towards more towards DC. So there's not a lot of meets. I don't think in Virginia yet. I actually don't know that there've been any. Um, so we're trying to kind of, kind of make them central. So it's not a, a huge haul from DC and it's not a long drive from Virginia. Um, and it's not a terrible drive from like Western Maryland, um, just so that we can have it available to people. So I think we've got three meets on the books for this year coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's one next weekend. Is that right? Or I don't think so. I saw I one recently. Know. Okay. I hope <laughs> nobody's asked me to ref. So, or I've forgotten and I owe some, I'm going to, I'm going to owe somebody an apology. One or the other. <laughs> Yeah, I got, uh, I had an email from Andrew the other day that was asking for refs and that's a four or five hour drive for me. And I said, well, if it rains, I can come, but you're not going to know if it rains until the day of. So I don't think I can help you. Um, Did you yeah. guys get the, um, get a notification about the local meet that's taking place right before nationals? Mm -hmm. uh, so yes. that people could take the bar and qualify. Um, I guess they need, uh, refs for that but I mean I'm getting in at noon so you know that's that's not gonna happen yeah, yeah. I I don't know about you Mel but I do not ref before I compete um I know a lot of people do and a lot of people are okay with it um but for me that's just I think people underestimate how much brain power it takes to sit in a chair and watch the same thing over and over and over again mm -hmm. Um, and by the end of it, my body hurts and yeah, uh, yeah. you wouldn't think, but yeah. Yeah. So for some, something like that last chance qualifier, because it should be very, very quick. Like I could pay, probably be talked into it, but, um, I have, and I try not to do it, but somehow I always end up doing it. Like I've, because I'm not, not a national referee yet. Wish me luck. I'm going to need it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've TC'd a lot. Um, and so standing around and, and hurting people and, and making sure everybody's where they belong. And like, it, it's, it can be a lot. Um, and I have consistently ended up doing it before I lift because as a super, I'm always last. Right. So I either volunteer ahead of me lifting or I don't volunteer. Mm -hmm. So I, tr I try, depending on what the schedule looks like, I try to push it up like, okay, I'll ref and then I'll have a day off and then, and then I'll lift. But that's, you know, when you have two day meets like that, that's not really one of your choices. So yeah. commentating seemed like, like kind of a happy medium, maybe mm -hmm. people, I shouldn't have to think so hard. I get anxious watching other people lift. Yeah. Um, like there's, there's a, a fine line between this is motivating and now I'm anxious. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, 
And I honestly, I sat for my referee certification because spotting and loading is hard and I don't want to. I've done it once and I said, never again, shout out to everyone. Everyone should yeah. have to spot and load at least once for the record, yeah. but I did it once. And I was like, mm, this is it yep. for us, for the particular meet that I spotted and loaded for, it was a 12 hour meet where you had to do load in and load out or you weren't yeah. paid. And so Ooh. it was, yeah, it was a long day, which is from a meat director's perspective, I completely get it from a spotter and loader perspective. It was very, very hard. Yeah. Um, and you know, by the end of the day, you're, you're done. You're over um, it. Yeah. The yeah first you're time, over it. Yep. The first time I spotted and loaded, someone dumped the bar on me. Apparently she did it all the time. Nobody, nobody warned me. Um, I followed her trying to not let her die, tripped over the ER rack and sprained my wrist, uh, two weeks out from the American open. Oh, and I was like, Nope, not doing this again. I'm out. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I was to do like rack heights and like that kind of stuff. If somebody needs help, but my, yeah, I, it seemed unnecessarily risky. Mm -hmm. yep. So did you still, uh, compete at the, Oh yeah. Yeah. How no, did... I actually best lifter somehow. I don't actually know how that happened. Uh, you're just that good. Like that's how good you are. You know what it is? I'm super, well, once you wrap your wrist, like I couldn't move my wrist anyway, so it was fine. Um, mm -hmm. But also I'm super clumsy. So at some point I'm just like, well, this hurts a little, but I guess we're going to be fine. Um, like I, I tripped over a peg in the gym this morning before my last deadlift. And I'm like, oh, well, that's going to leave a bruise. Yeah, I'm great at the only injuries I've had over the past few years have been just fluke like. I dumped a bar off the back, off my back one time. I've run into the, the rack way too many times. And Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's not always there and bolted to the floor. It just suddenly appeared. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like I didn't just take the bar out of that rack. And yeah, yeah for some reason, it's all of them there. Yeah. Um, so we do want to talk a little bit about what happened last year at Worlds. Um, as a powerlifting fan, I was watching and very upset for you. And as your friend, I was watching and was very upset for you. So whatever you want to share with what went down that day, um, now is your chance. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, really it, it was a super, super freak thing, right? I had, I had a good beat prep. Mm -hmm. I felt good going into things. I went and got a massage. I, you know, I, I was relatively chill as chill as I ever am. Uh, I owe a lot of, a lot of my handlers, I owe apologies too, because I'm a lot, um, I do try to warn them. It seems like a fair and reasonable thing to do. Um, so, um, the goal for the meet was to hit the world record squat. That was, that was our objective. Um, so I took my opener, everything felt fine. Everything felt good while I was warming up. Um, I went out for my second, which was lower than I wanted it to be. I actually wanted to try for the world record on my second. So Aaron got a lot of side eye when I realized what he did. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say all this story I know already, <laughs> but yes, that one. <laughs> uh, like I said, I, I owe a lot of apologies to my handlers because you're gone. Um, he, he can take it. It's fine. He's yeah. gotten enough from me too. It's fine. Uh, and, and as it turns out, it didn't matter. So um, I went out, I started the squat and it felt like somebody stabbed me in the quad. And I say that I've never been stabbed. I actually don't know, but it hurt a lot. Um, and I, it just, it dropped me. So, um, and so I, I dropped the bar on the spotters, which I apologized for and got yelled at for, which is how that works. Yeah. So, so Joey, um, the commentator, as they're carrying me off the platform, because I couldn't get up, I couldn't bear any weight on it initially. Um, like I'm, I'm walking away and I'm like, you guys, I'm really sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. He's like, don't you apologize to them? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I don't want to put anybody else in harm's way. If I get hurt, that's a me problem. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to get hurt because of me. Um, so they took me in the back, um, you know, straightening my ankle and bending my knee and like trying to see like what kind of mobility I had. And I, because I'm that person, I was like, you know what? I bet you if I roll this out, I can go out for my third. And like five people scream, no. Okay. So maybe I'm actually hurt. <laughs> I'm going to gauge everyone else's reaction to this. So like, okay, no more squatting. Um, managed to get myself up out of the chair. Um, kind of tried to roll it out. Couldn't, couldn't squat on it. Right. Like could not load that quad at all. Um, 
Joa and, and, you know, shout out to all my teammates as usual, because like, like Joa was like helping massage everything out because we were hoping it was just a cramp. Um, and we still don't entirely know what happened. Um, could have just been like very serious strain, could have been um, a small tear of the quad. Um, but once I got up and, and like walking around, like, I'm like, okay, I don't, I mean, I don't need that to bench and I barely need it to deadlift. Like, you know, and while I'm rolling it out, I, I, at some point I like, I was like, wait a minute. I'm like, Arian, I'm still in second, aren't I? And he's like, yeah. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Look, I, I'm probably not going to win now, but I'm going to get a total because I'm real contrary and I came all this way. So I'm not like, let's see what we can do. And that's, and that's, that's what we did. Just had to go at it. Yeah. Yeah. You were very well set up for a, like a world record should have been easy for you. Correct. Yeah. Well, I've, I, well, not now, but, um, prior to what happened at Europeans. So a British lifter whose name I can't remember right now. And I'm sorry for that. Um, reset the world record at 210. Um, but I, prior to that, I had squatted more than the world. I squatted more than the world record at nationals. So like it was in there, there was no reason for it to not happen other than, you know, bad luck and shenanigans. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I remember telling you afterwards, I'm like, you took second injured, like you took second place at world injured. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and part of like, on the one hand, I'm like, okay, that's, that's cool. Right. It's still, it worked out. My total is way down from where I wanted it to be because we were projecting me at like 560, 565, which turns out still would not have been enough to win, but I would have liked to have given Monique a run for her money. <laughs> mm. Why am I not gonna make it easy for her? Um, so that was a little disappointing, but it, it is also nice to know like, okay, cool. Like I, I finished this on like kind of one leg and I still did okay. Um, like Arian walked up to me at one point during deadlift and he's like, Hey, you want to, you want to pull for a medal and deadlift? And I was like, yes. And he's like, cool. And he just walks away and I'm like, Oh, all right. I guess we're going to try for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when you just go, whatever you want to do. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> right. Cause the goal at that point was a, to get a total. Um, and then just to see what kind of total we could put together without injuring myself worse. So as long as it didn't really hurt, like, yeah, let's, let's load it up and see what we can get. And if it does hurt, then we'll just stop so and this nationals will be your first meet since then correct it is i'm a i'm trying not to be anxious about squat like part of me is like already mentally preparing for because so i'm a little bit of a basket case anyway and until i get that first squat in i always feel terrible right like there was at one point there was a whole like bet going on that i was going to puke on a head judge <laughs> <laughs> because that's how bad I feel. And once I get that first squat in, then everybody kind of settles down and it's all cool. Um, and I'm, I don't know that it might not be worse this year just because of that. Like it'd mm -hmm. be. Now is Chris going to be handling you for this or is it going to be? Okay. Poor Chris. <laughs> I was going to say, if it's Arian, then maybe you just go for it. Like, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I feel like at, at this point they both know like, this is for not letting me take the world record on my second. <laughs> right. Again, it would have mattered because then I, I would have still gone down, but right. you know, so, and, and he probably made the right call, but my answer is always, I'm sorry, why did you put more weight on the bar? Which is also why I have a handler because no one should trust me right. to make decisions uh, I'm, yeah. and I make fine decisions for other people, but I can't do it for me because I get too emotional about it. Yes. So no, please, someone be my adult. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, you, you've had my coach as a handler too mm -hmm. before. And mm -hmm. that is my plan with him is just to say you, you put on the bar, whatever you think is best. I, I don't want any feedback this time. Um, it's your job at, at the point that I'm there. It's your job after that. Like it's not mine yeah. to pick the numbers. Yeah. So. We, we will argue about stuff like in the lead up, like when we sit down and talk about mm -hmm. goals, stuff like that. Like, like there were arguments there, but, but yeah, the morning I show up like, nope, this is no longer my problem. I'm here to lift. You're here to do like the hard mental stuff. Right. We're done. Yeah. Right. I feel like the more analytical somebody is, the more a handler actually helps on meet day because you tend to 
overanalyze everything and look at every little thing and kind of miss the big picture, you know, due to anxiety or, or, you know, nerves or whatever it is. So, yeah, I mean, I totally sympathize with you guys on that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 10 years in, I've learned a lot about myself. And what I've learned is I'm not, I'm not a responsible adult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually don't know your background in the sport. Like, when did you start? how did you get into it? Can you give a, a little bit of that background? So, oh God, how long have I been lifting at this point? Um, 2010, 11, somewhere in there. So I started out doing CrossFit um, and they made me run, which is stupid. Um, and so all the wads where they're like, oh, I'm gonna need you to do cardio. I was like, eh, but I don't want to. Um, but I got very strong, very fast. And then our gym started a barbell club. And my original goal was I'm gonna pop over there and do a cycle. And then I'm gonna go back to CrossFit. And then I remember that the CrossFit people make me run. And so I never went back. <laughs> I did a cycle with the barbell club and they, the, the, the goal of the cycle was to prep for Maryland States. Um, so uh, that was my first meet was Maryland States. Um, set a bunch of records, made somebody cry. Did not do that on purpose. It's not my fault. I did not intend to make her cry. Um, she, her coach had been hyping her up that she was going to set all these records and they didn't know I existed. And when, when I beat her, like she stole something, caused a lot of feelings apparently <laughs> and I feel bad about it um no I mean not bad enough to not lift but like I still feel bad about it um because I want everybody to, to like lift and be happy um but um and from that like I had a good experience I was way over caffeinated more apologies for more coaches um <laughs> but it was like oh and at the time like raw still wasn't like a big thing like this was before the first classic worlds. So like, we're looking at the numbers and I was like, Ooh, I could go to nationals. Like this could be cool. Vanika hadn't come out of retirement yet. You know, I was like, Ooh, I have a chance. And, and so that's, that's how we started. First nationals was in clean, uh, which I graduated from high school near there. So that was an experience. Um, and I dumped my second squad over my head <laughs> oh no yeah so I, I lost my upper back and it rolled up my back and it clipped me in the back of the head um the spotter saved me which was great thanks thanks guys um and I went out for my third and did the same thing and they saved me quicker because they already knew how that ended um and I think I came in like third out of like the four of us because I was a disaster I never traveled for me and I didn't know what I was doing I I finished the meet and I sat down I had myself a good cry uh which and then I like didn't want to cry because I was like I don't want to be to think like I'm a I'm a bad sport and I'm crying because I lost I'm just emotional <laughs> and I don't know what to do with this. Um, I watched Kimberly Walford almost get jumped at during weigh-ins. That was fun. Um, she so she'd already lifted and she was she was either coaching or volunteering, but she's sitting in the hallway where warmups were and she's got and I still remember this. She's got this giant mound of bacon and like these red velvet pancakes. And so um, we have like, yeah, right? I would have jumped her too. I would have jumped right. her too. <laughs> and you, the whole room just smells of bacon. Oh and God. somebody, somebody's like Kim and she looks up at the mouthful of pancake and she's like, what? <laughs> and somebody's like, I don't think you realize that you're in danger. And she looked around at all these girls like staring at her and like, she picked up her food and she just left. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Cause that would, would she have been, she would have been a 72 back then. Right. Cause that was when, before the weight class was changed. <laughs> Been a 63 back then. This was a long time ago. Really? Okay. And this was this was when they had the old weight classes, right? So it was like 82 and a half, 90, 90 plus. And it was like, oh, okay. Oh, we're not friends anymore. You have bacon. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would jump her. I would, uh, yeah. I mean, not her. <laughs> Right. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I would not jump Kim Walford. Yeah. <laughs> but if a lifter came in with uh, pancakes and bacon to weigh in, I would be <laughs> like, go away. Just go yeah. away. You're awful. We, we, at North Americans, we walked through carrying pizza for the coaches when like the 63s were weighing in. And man, the, those were some unhappy women. Like the looks we got. I'm, and I'm, 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 walk, I'm walking with Becky Holcomb. I'm like, walk faster. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's going to end real poorly for us. <laughs> well, I mean, the good thing is with if it was the 63s, I don't think, speaking as a 63 myself, I don't know if we could do much damage, but. <laughs> I feel like if they got the bacon, they would let her go. Like, you know, really, what's the goal here? That's that's hilarious. That's hilarious. So I mean, um, the goal is always the at weigh in, but yes. <laughs> yeah. So I guess um what do you what do you eat after you weigh in? Or do you do anything like that? Or um well because I'm a super. Yeah. Uh, my life's a lot easier. Um I have wandered into weigh in with like protein coffee. Oh. Um because I like caffeine. Um depends how much of that I drink before I weigh in kind of depends on when I'm lifting. Like if I'm lifting in the morning, like maybe it doesn't matter. Um, because I am obviously eating into the meat. Um, I'm, I'm still a relatively small super. Um, but I don't, you know, I, so I don't cut, but I don't try to be like ridiculously heavy. Um, I also usually feel super terrible before I start lifting. Like I'm nervous and when I'm nervous, I'm nauseous and then I don't want to eat anything. Um, so it is, it is legitimately like whatever I can talk myself into eating. So bananas, um, protein shakes that I probably don't actually need, um, uncrustables, like for years, the answer was strawberry frosted pop tarts. And then I realized that uncrustables are way better. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I only buy them when I'm competing because I don't, it's drama. I don't need in my life. I don't actually need to eat uncrustables. I'm not, not a toddler contrary to popular belief. Um, I can't keep them in my house if I buy them. That's my exactly. problem. I That's will exactly. eat the entire box the first day that I bring them home. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I only buy them when I'm getting ready to compete. Um, cause they're, they're pre packed they're easy to eat. Um, you know, anything, cause anything that's like dry, like I have a hard, I have to chew, to chew it too much. I don't want to, I don't want anything in my mouth. I don't, I just, my appetite is just really bad. Um, but because I know I have to eat something, it's okay. Like what, what can I like, like, look, it's an uncrustable, you know, you want it. Um, and that makes it easier. And then I just try to drink everything else. Right. So it's Gatorade and, and it's like I said, protein shakes and that kind of stuff, because, because it is easier to drink things than it is to eat at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I definitely noticed the, the person with the box of uncrustables is definitely the most popular person in the, in the warm up room. So well, and, and, and Chris said this years ago at Worlds, he was like, the best thing is like coaching the heavier lifters, like the 76s and up, because they always have food. And I didn't realize, I didn't realize how accurate that was until Worlds this year, where like I popped into the warm up room when the lighter lifters were lifting and they're like, I could, I could go first, like oatmeal and an apple. And I'm like, what are you talking about? If you made weight, why are we talking? Go eat. <laughs> right. Like, what are we doing here? And now I, so now I get it, right? Like, because Uncrustables and Oreos and candy and like, David Rick stole my Oreos at Worlds in Calgary. And I'm still real salty about it. And I'm sure he was, <laughs> he was, when I came back and I was like, dude, what happened? Like a whole family size package of Oreos. I didn't want them all. I put them out. I was like, have some Oreos. I figured there'd be some when I came back. I was wrong. Um, and I was like, who the hell ate all my Oreos? And, and somebody was like, David did it. And I look, and David Ricks goes, who? And he's got a mouthful of Oreo. So he just got ca caught red-handed, like, completely. And I'm like, oh, I. <laughs> it's David Ricks. You can't argue with David Ricks. You just got to <laughs> let the Oreos go. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I wasn't going to get them back. Like, so like those are, that's not the kind of thing you borrow. So. <laughs> yeah. I don't want them back at that point. Right. Yeah. Take them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, mine, mine is uh, strawberry Newtons. I am on a mission to convince people that this is elite nutrition. And so. I, yeah. Hanny was handling a lifter near us or like sharing the platform with us one time. And he was like, can I have one? Do you mind? Those look really good. I said, listen, I am on a mission to convince everyone that this is really exactly what you want in a meet. And so please take them, tell your friends about them, that this is, this is the proper nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> Spread the gospel of strawberry Newtons. So here's, so here's the question, right? So on crustables, grape or strawberry? Okay. So I can never find these. Maybe they'll be in Scottsdale, but the honey are the best ones. I, I have heard, I've heard the honey. I've heard they have like Nutella and honey. They do have Nutella ones. I 
one time. I haven't tried them. I don't, I don't know. I, so I have a rule that I will not do Nutella because I've never had it. And so I don't want to get hooked on something that I've never experienced before. Like everyone says that it's like crack and I don't need that in my life. Like I've got enough things that I overeat that that doesn't need to be part of it. Challenge you don't need. Julie, are you team Uncrustables? Huh? Oh, are sorry. you team Uncrustables? Oh yeah. Yeah. I like the grape. Um, and the Nutella is actually pretty good, but it's pretty heavy. Like I definitely wouldn't need a meat situation, but the, the craziest Uncrustables I've seen is I was at a meet. I think it was actually the Arnold a few years ago and they had, um, like Uncrustables with like meat in them, like savory Uncrustables. Oh, like you. Mm-hmm. Like cheese, like it's it's like it's like lunchable if someone made it into a sandwich. Yeah, yeah. I was I was kind of no. Oh. I would say yeah. no. But see, here's my thing. I don't thaw my encrustables, mm-hmm. so like that would be weird. Like the best part of an encrustable is the frozen peanut butter. Like yeah. as you bite into, otherwise I can make my own peanut butter and jelly sandwich for like a whole lot less right. money. But like the frozen part, like if you get them so that they're, I mean, you've got to thaw them enough that they don't, you know, chip your teeth. But, um, but when they're still frozen and you bite into it, that's like the best part of the Encrustable. Yeah. But I also like, I would absolutely not want meat and cheese during a meat. I know there are people that eat all kinds of crazy stuff. Like I saw somebody eating like a sub. Oh. And I'm like, that's no, that's, there's too much chewing and it's too much. No, like, no. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I'm with you, but I think in theory, a sandwich makes sense because you've got carbs in there. You got a little bit of protein, but not like an overwhelming amount. It makes sense, but I'm with you. I can't eat that much. Yeah. It probably makes sense nutritionally, right? It's just, to me, it's not right. appetite, but would I show up with a breakfast sandwich? Like I totally would, because again, bacon. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, you know, like you're, they tell you not to eat a lot of fat because it slows down your digestion um, mm-hmm. and all that. But I've definitely seen people walk in with like a large order of McDonald's fries. And as soon as I smell that, I'm just like, oh God, you know, like, I don't think I could do it. And I bet Amy knows, knows this. Have you ever watched Tristan? And I don't know if he still does it, but have you ever watched what Tristan eats before he lifts? I'm trying to think if I've ever been, I had to, but I, I don't remember. I watched him eat an entire box of zebra cakes oh. after what <laughs> that of, just seems like I, him. that is fascinating. I don't know. I mean, yet. Oh, I don't know if you guys um, watched his press conference after nationals, but he, um, I guess his, his handler had him um, chug like a, a, a squeezable mustard thing. Well, or- oh, so that, okay. So I can explain this. This is a, this is a team thing. Cause he and I have the same coach. So <laughs> there, there is a tradition and I'll, Julia, I will send you video. <laughs> Maybe we need to slice the video over this when we post it, um, of JK Mandola. Um, mm-hmm. it was at Maryland state the first time that I ever met Bill and it's Jake and someone else, Sean, um, passing the squeezable mustard and they're chugging it on the like just for fun Jake Jake wasn't competing that day he just was chugging it just for fun <laughs> so it's become like a running team joke but it supposedly helps with cramps like Oof. when you've done big water cuts which Tristan normally does um when you've done these big water cuts it supposedly helps with like cramps so that you're uh, I don't know it may be an old wives tale but that has become the running joke with us um yeah so my my trist my one Tristan story is um he and I ended up on a flight. This was before I'd hired Bill when I was looking for coaches. And he and I sit ended up sitting side by side on the plane. And so I was like running through coach up op- like options with him. I was like, oh, I'm looking at this coach, I'm looking at this coach, I don't really know where I'm gonna go or whatever. And I'm sure that he mentioned Bill had no clue, like was like, <laughs> Yeah, 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 whatever, Bill McCarthy, whatever. And um and so probably like six months into it, after I'd hired Bill, I'm sitting there going, there was this guy that I met one time who was like on the world team named Tristan. He was like a junior national team member or something like that. And oh wait, we have the same coach now. He was the one who was like sitting tall. So that's my Tristan 
um, yeah. story, but he, he definitely um, has some fun, some fun he moments. Was, I think I reffed his first meet. I think it was his first meet when he was like, I don't know, 15 or 16. And I want to say, if I'm remembering right, like somebody offered him a beer because even <laughs> at 15, 16, he looked like an adult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is funny to think, I mean, he would have been on the national team, what, three years ago for juniors, two or three like years ago. Yeah. Um, before, I mean, before COVID, I guess. So, um, so it's just, it, it is funny to think that like, not that long ago, he was a junior. Yeah. So now he's, and he's, he's one of Bill's longest term athletes, I think. So you yeah. think about that, put that in perspective too. Yeah, he's he's been around forever. I was shocked when I first learned about how young he was. Um, him and um, the coach Matt Cronin, um, they they both been around forever, but they're both babies, you know. Like they're mm-hmm. they're both really young. So yeah, yeah. It's interesting to watch people as they like age out, right? Like ten years isn't that mm-hmm. long, I guess, but it also is, right? Like. It's like, it's adorable to see people like, oh, I remember when you were 14 and, you know, and, and here, here you are like an adult, like having mm-hmm. to play with you. I'm sorry, but okay. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's weird. Yeah, the, the juniors now are crazy strong. I mean, they definitely I can hang. Yeah. What are they feeding these kids? I don't know. I don't and know. I, I, I still remember. So the, the last year before I aged out, um, and this goes way back. So this was Scranton. And I'm standing with Becky Holcomb and we're watching Leanne Hewitt deadlift, which by the way, Aaron was very rude to me about Leanne. Um, because after she weighed in, like I ran into him, like looking at the, the, uh, the board for the lifting order and everything. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I met her at weigh-ins. She's, she's really nice. She seems a little nervous. Um, I said, are you going to have a go at Panika? And he was like, no. I'm like, oh, he's like, she'll beat you though. <gasps> I mean, like, and he wasn't wrong, but also, like, damn, like, <laughs> it could have been a little nicer. So was she, it. was she one of Arian's clients? Uh, I think she was. He was definitely handling her. Um, okay, but she's like sixteen at the time, right? Like, this was her first yeah. national. And I remember standing with Becky, and she she went for her last deadlift, and it got it got real quiet, like, because everybody's like, oh, you know, there's gonna be the third pull, and there's gonna be a grind, and then you're gonna yell, and like, that's how it's gonna go down. And she pulled that thing like she was going to clean it. Like it was so fast that like the island, the audience is just like stunned into silence. And, and then I hear somebody, I think it was one of my friends start laughing because that's how ridiculous it looked. And I remember looking at Becky and I was like, you know what? She's your problem. I'm gonna walk over here and be old. Like, good luck. Like you're going to need the, (laughs) we're about to get, I was like, yeah, that's, that's it. I'm going to go be a master. We're, we're done. Hello. Help you. I mean, the, the talent pool and, and everything has just exploded in like mm-hmm. the last, I don't know, seven years. I remember one, mm-hmm. um, I, I think it was like 2017 Open Nationals and the total since, I mean, I thought the totals were astronomical back then and <laughs> they've just, you know, they, they've gone way up. I remember, I think Russ might have squatted like 660 and everyone was just, you know, or, or attempted it. I, I don't remember it. Everyone was like, you know, shocked by this. And now, you know, people are doing that in the, the 74s. So it's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and he, it's crazy. yeah. Like watching the Sheffield, like, like, cause we had like a whole watch party for the Sheffield. And I was like, I was like, okay, so just, just so we're all clear on this, the 52 kilo lifter is going to open with 150 kilo squats. So right. the rest pretty much just quit. <laughs> Why are we here? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That watching that was crazy. So look and go, imagine being the first person ever to squat at the Sheffield. Like yeah. imagine just being that first person. Cause I don't, I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to be the first person. <laughs> I want to be somewhere comfy in the middle or yeah. towards the end. Like I do not want to be the first person. And so imagine all that pressure. You're the first person out there and squatting 150 like yeah 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 (laughs) yeah and it used to be I mean it you know we're looking at masters who are I mean like yourself competitive in the open division too where it's like man you know that it's just yeah it's strong strong yeah 
And I do think some of that's because like, I know when, when, you know, classic worlds first started, right. So we were getting masters who started later, right. Like, like we were getting lifters who legitimately started in their forties. And now I think what we're seeing is more people sticking with the sport and aging out. So Mm -hmm. they have five, 10 years open um, and they, they look different, right. Mm -hmm. They look they look more athletic. They have, why? <laughs> it's okay. Mine's pulling me right here. So apparently pets yeah. just want attention right now. Uh, yeah. It, it just, you can, you can, I don't want to say it, it's a different in professionalism, but a little bit it is right. Like, like people have kind of made this their business and they're sticking with it even into their, they're not just like, Oh, I'm not competitive in the open anymore. I'm going to pack it in. It's like, there's still, there's still stuff to do. And I, mm-hmm. I, like it's weird to be a master right especially a young like you're not old enough that it's super cool that you're still lifting um right you're you're competitive in the open but you're not competitive in the open you're not going to win um but like and you're not you're not a junior so you're not the future of the sport but i i do think like there's value to seeing okay so we're back um i think we'll just get um paul to kind of edit out this whole section um (laughs) yeah (laughs) I mean, this may make it interesting. We don't know. <laughs> um, all right. So, Julia, did you have a question? Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess, um, you know, we, we touched on the Sheffield a little bit, um, and I'm obligated to ask you about it. Um, but, you know, as a, as a master's lifter, um, you kind of have a unique perspective here. So what, what did you think about it? And, um, you know, did it inspire you? Um, you know, who was your favorite lifter? All those things. <laughs> I mean, so I think it's super cool to see that that's where the sport can go, right? And and it's it's always cool, whether it's the Sheffield or, Sheffield or whether it's World, to see just how, how far people are pushing the boundaries, right? Um, I think it's hard as a master because we don't have an equivalent to that, right? Like Master's World is very cool. Anybody who ever gets a chance to go, you should totally go because you never know when your last chance is going to be. Um, but it goes back to kind of, I think it's hard sometimes for the Masters to really get a lot of attention, right? Like somebody, I was talking to one of the the kids at the gym, I, kids, which is everyone younger than me, that's complaining that they're going to turn 30 and they're old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like everybody slow your roll because I got some bad news for you. Um, like, cause like, he's like, oh, you have sponsors. And I was like, oh, that's like, no, no, no one cares about, about the fat old lady. Like, that's not, that's not a thing. <laughs> I'm not hot. I'm not Shelly Stetner. I'm not 70 where people are amazed that I'm ambulatory, much less lifting. Um, you know, so that's, that's not, um, so it would be nice. And I, I you know, it would be nice, I think, to see more masters and to see that get a little bit more attention. And I do think Powerlifting America does a great job giving giving masters attention. I'm not trying to take away from it at all, but because I think that for a whole subset of our population, you get to see a different way to age, right? Mm-hmm. I'm 45 here. I have friends that are like, ah, I'm too old for stuff. And I'm like, so you're going to sit on your couch and wait to die? Like, if you're lucky, you got another 40 or 50 years in you. Like, that's a long time to just hang out because you're too old. Um, and I think it's true of things other than powerlifting as well. Like, we can age differently. We can be more active. We can, like, okay, at some point, you're going to stop setting PRs, and that sucks. But you can still be healthier and more active than than a lot of people, you know? And I, I do think it's 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 kind of a cool example to set if we can get more people interested in watching the masters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I work with um, women who are 40 to 70. And one of the biggest things that I see is that, um, you know, like they don't um, think that, you know, they think they're too old. They don't think lifting is for them because Mm -hmm. when they were growing up, you know, it wasn't really encouraged. Um, So you get a lot of women who are, new to the sport in their 40s and even 50s um and I think it will start to pick up and be more visible um over time but I think we're kind of at the right at the beginning Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think as numbers get added, um, it was interesting because I was listening to Shelly's interview on the on the way here, uh, on the way back home. And, um, you know, it was interesting, her perspective of like, that it's sad that there aren't, that she really doesn't have competition. Um, I think in our, in the M1s, you are starting to see, um, you know, someone, I was sharing with someone what I was doing, getting ready for nationals and why it was important and all that kind of thing. And they said, I said, yeah, I, I started when I was 35. And so I knew that I would never be competitive and open that, that that ship had kind of sailed, but that I wanted to get ready for masters when I could be competitive. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they said, well, it is true that like the pool's smaller, but the other side of it is kind of what you said. That also means that people have been training their entire life for it. Um, and I, you know, because I started at 35, I was quote unquote behind. Um, and it is true. You see people who have been in fitness their entire life who are just really, really strong. Uh, but it, you know, it, it is one of those things too, where you sit there and go, cause you hear all the time people, especially women who say, well, I can't do that. I can't load myself. I can't, um, lift heavy weights. I can't do what you're doing. And you want to go, well, everyone has to squat every day. Mm-hmm. And when you stop having to squat, we have problems, right? Because you have to use the bathroom. Like you have to be able to squat every day. And so if you squat in the gym, that then makes that easier. Um, and it's not bad for your knees to build up the muscle around that joint. Um, and yeah, it, it's probably not the best to load, you know, a 600 pound squat on your back either, but you know, it is important for us to keep our bodies, our muscles strong so that we can do normal everyday life things that everyone has, everyone has to deadlift. Everyone has to squat every day. Maybe we don't lift weight off of our chest every day. That's not something that I personally do on a regular basis, but, but the other two things, definitely I do. I mean, we all do it. We all have to pick things up off the floor. Um, so the longer that you can keep that up, the more, the better it's going to be for you in the long run. Yeah. And I think everybody suffers a little bit from, from comparison, right? Like, am mm-hmm. I ever what, what Bonica squats? I'd love to say that I'm going to, but probably I'm not right. Like that's, you know, we are where we are. Um, but like saying, oh, well, I can't do what you do. So I'm not going to do it at all. You don't have to do what I do. Mm-hmm. Start, right. start with, because when I started, like my squat was a hot mess. <laughs> like, like it was, Ooh, it was real bad. Um, so like the very first, like, like try to hit a heavy squat I did for the, like our barbell club to like sort of assess where people were was a real sketchy looking 185, you know? Um, and I, I think especially where we're talking, like, like I said, if you can go get to worlds, like go, it's cool. But if all you want to do, if you want to like power lift the way that people run 5Ks, right? Like it's recreational. I'm going to, I'm going to pop into this local meet. I'm going to lift all the weight I can lift. And I'm going to go have a beer with my friends. You know, if it, it, it lends your training focus because now you have a deadline. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and it gives you kind of an objective measure of where you are, but, but training is good for you. And it's, and, and I think for a lot of women, it also becomes a confidence thing, right? Like I can do this hard physical thing. So other things in life are like, I don't say easier, but like it changes your confidence, right? Like I can do this. So that's going to be fine. Like I didn't die squatting 400 pounds. So having this hard conversation at work, that's cool. This is, <laughs> this is way easier. Um, and I, I don't think aside from just the physical benefits of it, I don't think people also appreciate the the confidence and the mental aspects that come from from participating in any sport whether it's powerlifting or marathons or crossfit or whatever like the things that you learn are applicable to all sorts of other parts of your life so going back to what you said about the Sheffield and that there's not a master's equivalent I think the good thing that we do have being in a small pool is that we do have more opportunities in general, um, Mm -hmm. because it's a smaller pool. We don't have more opportunities than open does because they have Sheffield and worlds and nationals. 
um, in NAPF. Um, but so they have the extra Sheffield thing that we don't have. But what we do have is a better chance to make it to the other events than open do. And so, you know, being being 40 plus, most of us have some sense of expendable income, um, even though it would be nice if we would get a little more financial support for some of these trips to represent us. Um, so yeah, you're not going to get the attention of Sheffield, but you can still go to Mongolia or you can still go to the Cayman Islands and hang out with your friends. And I was talking to someone the other day about that masters are motivated. Most of our motivation as masters, knowing that we aren't going to be competitive and open is we want to go to fun places and hang out with our friends and compete mm -hmm. like, like kind of like what you were saying with the running equivalent, um, you know, yeah, let's go lift some weights, make some PRs for ourselves. And then go hang out on the beach after like, yeah. like I plan on being by the pool a lot in Scottsdale. <laughs> like, like that is the plan. Um, yeah. my, my plan is to go to dinner with people after I can eat again and, um, and have fun, you know? Yeah. So we do have more of those opportunities because of the smaller pool, which I don't want to ever take for granted. Um, yeah. because I wouldn't have, I mean, I wouldn't have those opportunities as an open lifter. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I think, like I said, so the Sheffield is, is a super cool development to see in our sport and I'm excited to see what else we get out of it. Um, I, I do feel like a little bit, the masters have to be a little bit more intrinsically motivated because unless something like that comes up for us, then it's not, I'm going to do this super cool meet mm -hmm. on that level. Right. Like not, not saying North Americans are not super cool. not saying worlds are super cool. Um, because you get to meet all of these people and you, and you do even like, Belarus was interesting. Um, if you've never tra traveled to Eastern Europe, like culturally, that's some some weird stuff. Um, and, and we did, like people struggled with it. Like if, and I've, I've noticed this about masters in the US and I, I had this conversation with one of the British lifters, like because the US is so big, like you can travel a lot of places and see a lot of stuff and never actually leave your own country. So it's not uncommon to have masters that have never traveled overseas and they're, they're more freaked out, I guess, because being older makes you less flexible sometimes by how different things are. Like when I got to Belarus, the first thing I got was, my God, you have to see the toilets. It's amazing. It was not amazing. It was not a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that's, fuss that's fussy and complicated. I don't know if I can use that. Um, like, I don't know if I have the coordination to pull that off, but cool. We're, I guess we're going to figure it out. Um, and you're just not prepared for those things, right? Like, oh, people here are really unfriendly. No, nah, they don't smile. They're 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 fine. They're just they don't. It, it's different culturally. It's different. Um, Listen, you're from Maryland. Y'all don't smile either. <laughs> okay, so, not actually from Maryland, so I weird people out. Um, because I've lived everywhere. I was born in Germany. Oh. Um, I did seven schools in six years through high school and middle school. <laughs> this is just where the army let me off. I, I don't, I, I've been here, I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else, but I still don't know that I consider myself a Marylander. Like I spent a lot of time growing up in the South. Those people are very friendly, sometimes too friendly. Too friendly sometimes. Well, so <laughs> let, let's, let's get real. We're friendly to your face. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, bless your heart. Like <laughs> <laughs> bless your heart. <laughs> um yeah bless that's my new favorite word by the way it's just bless 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 yeah <laughs> I think I um I I think we were talking I can't remember what we were talking about but I I definitely misinterpreted some southern slang wrong from you once <laughs> oh I know what it was it was um it, it became a debate even among my southern friends if you say that someone's a mess Oh, in yeah. the south it means that they're like like if it's a kid it's usually like they're very active they're very like hyper and energetic and it's not a bad thing it's just like oh my gosh they're a mess um and it's it's meant to be a compliment almost like the bless your heart in reverse but <laughs> i had i had some southerners who were like yeah that's a bad thing i don't like it depends how you say it like if you say man that person's absolutely a mess then that really is not nice. But if you're like, especially 
people use it a lot for little kids. They'll be like, oh, he's such a mess. Um, and they mean it like they're very active. They're very like rambunctious and, um, but it's not a bad thing. It's not like there are messes in like, I don't like them or I don't, um, I don't enjoy that about them. It's like a little kid that just has a lot of spunk to them. Mm-hmm. So I, I call my dog a mess. <laughs> she is. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the videos you or the the stories you post, I'm like, she's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> well, so uh, do you guys have any other Southern slang that you want to uh, to share with the world? <laughs> I mean, most people know y'all at this point. Everyone uses y'all at this point. Um, and then yonder. Do you know what yonder means? Mm-hmm. Julia, do you know? Like far away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Down yonder. Uh, um, I noticed the southern slang is real non-specific. Like it, it, it is. Con- it is very much contextual. Yonder could be the other room. Yonder could be over the hill. Yonder's somewhere not mm-hmm. here. Um, yeah. All y'all pull up. Mm-hmm. It's like y'all is plural, but all y'all is something else. All y'all is yeah. Like y'all can be singular, or yeah. it could be all y'all. Yeah. Yeah, Smart and part. I will say. Yeah, my parents uh, are from Ohio, so there are certain words that we weren't allowed to say because they're very, very Southern, Um, but especially because I now live in a small town, so, um, and not my first time living in a small town, so some of those words every once in a while will come up, and I'm like, oh, I don't use them, but like, so I, I had a job one time in West Virginia, and they would use, I worked with a lot of Midwestern students. And they would come to me for translation of what the what the West Virginia people were saying. And every once in a while, I'd be like, I have no idea. Oh, we yeah. don't say that in South Carolina. We don't. Um, but yeah. We'll put up a, a, like a cheat sheet for the commentary. There we go. National. There we go. Yeah. Like and ch- I would like to point out South Carolina and North Carolina are two different states with two different personalities. So just want to put that out there. <laughs> Well, and what we really have to see is, so I have a wandering accent, right? Because I've, I've lived a lot of places um, and I spent a decent amount of time in Texas. And then, and this was the weirdest thing and it drove my mother insane. When I joined the army, I ended up in Japan. But all my friends were from like Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. So I came back with a stronger Southern accent than when I left. And my mom's like, I don't understand what happened. And I was like, yeah. These are still the people I was talking to. So it's still a problem. Um, and even my first nationals in Colleen, like we got off the plane and by the time we cleared the airport, like the accent was back. And my husband was like, what is happening? Cause he's from California. And he's like, I don't know what this is. And I'm like, just go with it. Like, it's, it's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. My, fa- my favorite thing right now is my younger sister has the thickest Southern accent of all of us because she was here the longest, I guess. I don't know. I get, yeah, whatever. Um, and, but she married someone from Mexico. And so they speak to their kids in both languages, Spanish and English. And I heard her one day talking to someone in Spanish, like very fluent Spanish. My sister is completely fluent in Spanish, but with the Southern accent. And I'm like, you sound so hilarious right now. <laughs> I love it. Cause it's, I mean, it's perfectly fluent, like perfectly fluent, but I mean, someone from Mexico may be like, that's not really fluent, but um, but her accent is just so thick. It's just such a southern accent. I'm like, mm, coma es sauce. <laughs> <laughs> so what um what are your goals for nationals? Maybe you don't want to talk exact numbers, but what are you thinking about nationals? What are your hopes? Um, so we always rank goals, like there's primary goals and there's secondary goals. Um, so the primary goal is to win. Duh. nobody 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 dislikes winning um and for me like nationals is always a bit more stressful because nationals determines what else I get to do right so yeah. if I go to I lose like that's fine we'll start our new competitive year and, and it is what it is it's cool to win but if I don't it doesn't stop me from doing anything else but if you don't win nationals it limits some of your options for your you know the rest of your competitions that you can do so um I'd like to wait and keep my options open um and then, you know, we have some goals for numbers. Like I would, I would, without going to specific numbers, um, mm. like to have a solid squat that kind of solidifies that I am recovered and things are normal. 
um, like to get back close to that world record. And I, I will almost certainly will not go for it at nationals, but I'd like to get close um, to kind of assess where we are. Um, 210 is a lot. <laughs> so um, I actually, I'm, I am going to put this number out here. Uh, so I've squatted 300 or squatted, sorry, bench 300 a couple times in the gym now. I would really like to take that out of the meet and make it official um especially since like with within like the ipf and and the national federations of the ipf we've only had four masters ever do that so i'd love to make really? that fun yeah yeah oh, i didn't know that yeah if you like if you look at other like like tested federations that are not ipf affiliate there's there's more um but yeah so most of them are 84s shocker or are supers shocker so mm -hmm. um but yeah so i'd like to like to get that out of the way um and then just, you know, because I like records, any records I can manage to squeeze in there, I'm, I'm here for them. <laughs> I'd like to- I'm assuming you have all the Maryland state records already. Uh, I, so probably, I've actually not done a powerlifting America meet in Maryland because I'm always reffing, uh, yeah, but I do- hmm? We're gonna look this up. Yeah. So I have all, I have all the, the, the masters American records. That's the thing right now so yeah you have all the records you have all you actually have all the open and the master records oh, wow. okay that make me sad mm -hmm. uh it's good for my ego <laughs> so, <laughs> um you know so probably we'll do north americans probably um and that's kind of a quick term for nationals so um being a bit more conservative if we can afford to be so that we can really just like go back into a training cycle and be ready for North Americans is probably where things will end up. Mm -hmm. um, because again, to the, you know, the, I want to do cool meets, but also I want to go to cool places and do cool meets. So, you know, the Caymans does not look like it will suck. Tough life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, sounds awful. Lift mm -hmm. all the way, go try and give myself skin cancer and alcohol poisoning. Um, <laughs> not in that order. Uh, well, and not to mention the fact that this is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're the one who sent me this. So I think it's right. Uh, this is the last year that the masters will be with the open at North American. Yep. So it's not just the masters are going to North Americans. It's also Ray Williams is going to North Americans. It's Julia Williams is going to North Americans. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, it would be cool to be able to go hang out, not just with the masters, but also with everyone else since this is the last year that's going to be like that. Yeah. I, and I don't know anything because this has not actually come up, but like looking at the report from the, the general assembly for the IPF, it looks like um, there's more of a push to make North Americans a bigger meet. All of them, like even, even when they split out the masters and the juniors from the open, mm -hmm. um, make it look more like what goes on in Europe. Like, like ma European masters is a big deal. European Open is a big deal. So, you know, and and we we have a lot of cool places to go for North Americans, mm -hmm. right? We have all of those islands where the weather is lovely and, you know, like, and then, you know, Moose Jaw aside, because that was my first North Americans was in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, uh, which is like being in Kansas, frankly. <laughs> um, but like, you know, what if we did North Americans in like Toronto or Calgary or like even St. John's? St. John's was great. Uh, a little cold in October, but whatever. Um, like we do have really cool places to go and do these meets. So, you know, it, if we make them bigger and we, we, we bring some of our higher level lifters, right? Like, like I was looking at the nominations and, and Taylor Atwood's on there as a reserve for North Americans. You know, interesting. Watch that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah. I have some. There are a couple of combinations I want to see happen, and I don't know, Julia. I don't think are they waiting until after the um, age group to make that public, make the roster public. Uh, for North Americans, or yeah, like, do you know who already is on from Open? Who is already like signed? Oh yeah. So um. Well, we know who's accepted so far. So we know, um, 
I obviously Ray Williams, I think um, Claire, Megan Herbert, um, you know, we got some big names, uh, uh, Christina Paraki, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a really strong team this year. And to your point, yeah, they are making an, um, an effort to, to make it a bigger meet and to put more emphasis on it because, mm -hmm. you know, people, even in the U S people like, like stop what they're doing to watch Europeans on YouTube. Like they watch the live mm -hmm. stream. Um, and I think that they, you know, uh, Robert Keller really wants to turn it into something like that. And um, I think that that would be really cool because right now, like the attention is on Europe and we have so many great lifters here, you know, so. Yeah, yeah the we, depth is crazy. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's so many open lifters that would do well at Worlds and they're, they're not going to go because we just don't get to send that many people. So mm -hmm. somewhere else that they could turn up and like do amazing things like, yeah, it's North Americans. It's still an international level meet. You can still set world records there. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you if you lost by half a kilo at nationals. Like, yeah, let's you know, it, it's great to think that you might have a stage to still do something cool. I think that's, um, Julie, you know, cause you were, you're her weight class. Didn't Ellen do that last year? I know she went to NAPF, but did she send her set a world record at NAPF or was it just a national? Uh, who? Ellen, um, Liverpool. Oh, I'm not sure. I, I think she was, um, I should know this. She's a teammate too. I should know this too. Um, let me I can look it up real quick. Um, oh, I don't see. She hit 170.5. So obviously that was some sort of record, but I can't remember if it was an American or a world. It, it would have had to have at least oh, been a North American. Yeah. It was a North American record. That's what it was. It was a North American record. So you can hit North American records at North American too, yeah. which is just another option of, you know, if you're not quite at the world record state, you can hit a North American world or North American record. Yeah. Um, well, and yeah. also as evidenced by um, Carlina's invitation to Sheffield, um, that's another. Yeah. So, you know, even mm. if you don't make worlds, um, you can, um, if you put on a, an impressive performance at North Americans, you know, um, that puts you in the running for those mm -hmm. wild card spots. So, yeah. 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 It'll, it'll be crazy to see. I, I want to see Ray healthy and ready. Um, I think that's a very dangerous Ray to have at North Americans. Um, you know, he's obviously had a lot of life changes over the past year. And once that gets settled down, it will be crazy to see what he can put up. Yeah. He's another one who's, you know, been around forever, but he's not that old. Like, I, I think he's mid thirties. You know, maybe. I think so. Ah, he might be, he might be a little bit later now. I'm trying to think. I thought I heard something the other day that like he would be a master in like 2025. Oh. Um, so, but that would be the year he turned 40. Mm -hmm. And I could be totally, and if I'm, if I'm just making stuff up, like, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, like I, re I remember watching Ray at his first nationals mm -hmm. um, because I was, I was helping a teammate and I was standing on a chair because I couldn't see over all the large men that were in front of me. Mm -hmm trying to watch him um so yeah it, it's it's good to see people staying with the sport you know and and being successful with it not just sticking with it and being like ah, I showed up and I, I came in 15th like no like you could send Ray to Worlds and he would turn in a good performance you know having well and it, thing to watch yeah and I mean Mike this year like that at Nationals was crazy to watch I was literally that was probably my favorite battle to watch because you're sitting there going oh yeah it's my key he's a master he'll just go as master and then you sit there and go I started doing the math and I'm like whoa, whoa, whoa he's he's really close to winning yeah. um so it was crazy because he took second right he ended up taking a second I, I think. think so yeah um what Enrique's third deadlift got turned down I think and um so he didn't know that at the time um I think it was being challenged at the time that he was lifting so it got really really crazy there at the end that yeah. was the time Tristan was the time Tristan was lifting it had been overturned at the exact same time that he went out um which 
you know, I've got, I've got some feelings about that and I don't know what can be done about that, but obviously having an overturned lift will change. We're all competing to win, right? So we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily going for our personal best total at things like nationals. We're going for what's going to win. And so what someone else does is going to affect your attempt selection. So if all of a sudden what someone did is overturned and you don't have a chance to change your attempt, um, that changes the entire game. And I don't know, um, one, I don't know what can be done about it, but I also don't think that's entirely fair to have that happen as a lifter's going out. Like there should be a pause in the, um, while they're deliberating, there should be a pause to deliberate. And then, you know, I'm sure someone who is a cat one ref will, contact me and say, well, this is why we don't do it that way. But, um, yeah. but those, cause that, that happened twice that happened yeah. with the Tristan Lugo, Mike T situation. And then that happened with someone, another, they, another one of the men's battle. Who? Um, it was a uh, deuce and, um, Sean Jin. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. And it does like on third deadlifts that absolutely impacts your choices right? We had something happen at mass at a uh, nationals a couple of years in the previously where somebody lifted as a master, but also lifted in the open and they chipped a master's record that they shouldn't have been allowed to chip. And because I was also masters in the open, but I was in a different flight, then I couldn't beat her on body weight. And I had to pull more. And technically I never should have had to, because she shouldn't have been allowed to take that record as a chip because it, she's also list, listed as an open lifter. So mm-hmm it gets a little bit weird, right? Like, like the gamesmanship is part of the sport, but how do we do it in a way that you're not, that you're still allowing people to make smart decisions, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is. I do feel like, like, I'm not, I'm not gonna hate on anybody that goes to the jury for their athlete because that's, that's why they're the there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do personal feelings. I do feel like the jury has gotten a little bit too engaged lately right? Like, like the, it, and some, you said the same thing. We're going to get yelled at by, by higher level referees, right? Yeah. Like jury is supposed to be turning over obvious mistakes that the referees made, not being a second look at the lift. So if, if the referees didn't obviously make an error, then the jury sh- shouldn't be getting involved. There, there was one and I won't name what one, but people could probably figure it out that as I was watching high profile meet that just happened as it happened I was like I feel like that squat was high but my ankle may be wrong and got three white or two must have been two white lights because it went to the jury so two white lights the jury overturned it Mm -hmm. I don't like jury overturning depth calls um I think it needs to be egregiously high and I I sat there and was like okay on the one hand I thought it was high too like I did think it was high, but I also was watching from a live stream, not there in the chair, right beside it, um, at a high profile meet where you're, you've intentionally selected refs who know what they're talking about. Um, I, I just, I have a really hard time with that one in particular. Now I've been on the other side where I've been in the chair and had a jury come over and talk to us and overturn a lift. And so I've seen the process and um, I think for the most part, the jury does come and talk to the refs and get their input. And, and that, that is how the jury works. At least that's how I've seen it work. Um, and there are times when I think it's only fair, um, because refs are human and they make mistakes or mm-hmm. they don't see something that the jury sees. But that was a case where I was like, mm, I don't know that that was egregious enough that you should have overturned that one. Um, yeah. but I'm also not an IPF ref. So you know, yeah. they're, they're the ones on the jury for a reason too. And I want to respect that too. Yeah. It's, it's tough. Right. And even as a referee, like, like I had somebody at one point, this is a local me, but they came to me and they were like, I have video. I know that was a good deadlift. And I was like, I, first of all, I, we're not having this discussion. Right. Mm-hmm. Like her video angle is not the same angle as the referees. Um, and I'm sorry that you feel that way, but we don't have a jury because it's a local meet. And I'm never going to tell you that the referees are wrong mm-hmm. because I'm not sitting in the chair and I don't know what they saw. So I, I kind of have to trust that they saw what they say they saw. Um, and does it suck that you didn't get your third deadlift? It does. 
And we've all, we've all been there, right? Your third attempt, whatever, that's, it's a record or a yeah. win, whatever. And you don't get it. And it, it sucks. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to talk about how many, how many reps I took my, my third deadlift up to after last year. Cause I, I was sitting there going, I see what you see, but I disagree with the call and yeah. I didn't have a jury to debate it with. Um, yeah. So it, yeah, it, it, it does uh, think. And, 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 you know, and, and it goes both ways. Right. So I feel like you gotta be a little philosoph- philosophical about it because I have gotten this and I'm like, now that was, somebody should have called me for that one, but they didn't. And mm-hmm. so, yay. Um, I've had juries and I had this happen, happen at a meet where I pulled. So I, I don't actually want to say this because I, I'm, I'm not going to go to the details. Sometimes my deadlift looks weird there. That's what I'm going to say. Um, and I don't want to call anybody's attention to it if it happens. Um, but as I walked past the jury table, somebody leaned over and went, Oh, look at that. Christmas came early. Wow. I liked, so he, there was nothing they could do about it. And nobody protested me. And I was like, Oh, that was a little hurtful. I mean, I, I know why you said it, but also. <laughs> would, that be, would that be a bless your heart situation? Would that, that was a bless your heart situation. Yeah, for oh, sure. I- yeah. I had one, um, I had one recently where I, my opening squat was fine. My second squat, I was like, mm, I felt like that was high. And then, so like, I, I have a big towel. Um, hopefully none of my refs are watching our, our refs. Cause I think we'll probably have the same ones, um, yeah. are watching this, but uh, I have a big tell that if I think it's high, I'm going to stare at the lights. Like it's just a big tell. And so I was sitting there staring at the lights and all three of them were by And I was like, well, okay, I'll accept my gift and move on. Yeah. Um, and then the, I was saying something to a, a friend, like while we were waiting to line up, I was like, yeah, I thought my second one was high. And she's like, yeah, I thought it was too. And she was like right behind one of the refs and someone squatted and theirs was high. And we were like, that was high. And they got three whites. And she goes very loudly behind the ref. Yeah, they're not calling depth calls today. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, so third squat, I get one red light from that one, that one ref. And I was like, thanks a lot, dude. <laughs> thanks so much. And my third squat, I was like, that felt fine. But my second one, I was like, yeah, I'll I'll own up that that one is probably high. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I and and it's you know it is it is weird. It's it's hard sometimes I think too because you know the lifters. So one of your teammates, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Um, I read him at a meet for jumping my press command. And then I said something because he's a good bencher. Right. And I was like, what are you mm-hmm. doing? You no know better. And he's like, I've been jumping your press command for like two years. <laughs> Cause your press command is so consistent. I can time it. He goes, in that time it got a little, a little bit away from me. I'm like, Oh, wow. rude. and, but it's the risk you take, right. It's the strategy. Mm-hmm. That if you time it just right. Then you're anticipating the command, but you don't get caught. And I was the only one that caught him because I'm the one that gave the command. So he got two white lights anyway. So it didn't, it didn't matter. That's how close he was. And I was like, man, I'm gonna leave you down there forever next time. Like, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the heads. And he, you know, Jeff's not a big lifter. He's a 66 and he puffs up like, come at me, little man, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> I get, I'm just picturing this whole thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And there have been, I mean, like you said, there have been times when I've gotten away, I got one red light on a bench that I didn't touch my chest on and like popped it up a little, like I didn't beat the command, but I didn't have it fully on my chest and only one ref saw it. So I only got one red. And I was like, thank you for that one. Um, yeah. but yeah, you, when you're in this long enough, you start to know the refs and it's kind of fun to goof off with them too. And be like, <laughs> like yeah. we're gonna have fun. Yeah. You gave me red. Okay. I deserve it. I'm going to yeah. go. <laughs> be philosophical about it. You're going to get lifts that you shouldn't, and you're going to miss lifts that you probably should have got. And like I said, it sucks when you're, when you're pulling for placing or whatever, but it's a thing that happens. Um, and, and you're totally right. Like you love to see a head ref that benches on bench because they give commands the way they want to get mm-hmm. them. And yeah. I, I have looked out at referees and been like, Oh, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> yeah. And we all, I mean, we all complain about the same things, even being a referee. Like I have come off the platform, like that press command took forever. Yeah. And I, I did it. And then somebody pulled a video and I was like, all right, look, it felt really long. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> going to be your stereotypical lifter that can place. They I've, I've had it here locally where they're like, well, we don't really want you to head ref during bench because your, your commands are too long. And I was like, are they, <laughs> or are they accurate? <laughs> are they? You, I can hear people behind me talking smack about how awful it is and how mean I'm being. And I'm like, mm, am I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a I had a meet that I kind of co-directed, helped out with, and people kept complaining about the head refs. 
uh, bench commands and I watched the one and this person's like bouncing all over the place. And I was like, no, it was no. an accurate press command. Like y'all just have been so used to people just going, you know, start press, not watching the bar, but it's the bar has to be motionless. Yeah. Um, and, it, well, and, it, and I've heard this from other referees, not, not in a long time, but I've heard, well, well, you know, it's a local meet, we should be nice to them. Why? So they can go to nationals and, and bomb mm -hmm. out what the standard is like, you're not, you're not actually helping them mature as a lifter. Like the standard is always the same, always. And it should be. Yeah. 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 I, and I, I always say it still goes in, um, open power lifting the yeah. same way. So, yep. you know, whether or not they're going to go to nationals, it still goes in open power lifting the same way. And so we should be treating all lifters the same. Yeah. And yeah. that doesn't mean more harshly either. No. That just means to the, the same standard from local to world. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I'm writing these captions and I'm going over everything, um, I do notice myself um, looking at the totals at, you know, IPF. Um, competitions like worlds or NAPF and a lot of the times they're a lot they're a lot lower than at like national or um, local meets and obviously part of that is travel but mm -hmm. I think it's well known um, that you know the judging is incredibly strict at these mm -hmm. international meets and I think that mm -hmm. it would probably be a good idea to prepare our lifters for that rather than you know letting them get away with yeah yeah. And, I think and right now, everyone's question mark is the bench, um, the bench yeah. standard. So, yeah. And I think yeah. some of that is, is met, uh, how mature is your, your referee, right? You get a local referee who has not, or, you know, not spent a lot of time in the chair. They're not comfortable calling some things. They're not sure what they saw. So mm -hmm. I think it does cut both ways, right? It's not always just, oh, I'm going to be nice because it's a local meet. Sometimes it's just a lack of confidence on the part of the referee. Um, but you know, you don't have that at, at worlds. Like, no, no, those people are going to call you for everything. And then also mm -hmm. like travel, like it's weird to go to, to another country with weird food and, and uh, you know, the time difference. And like, I think it takes far more of a toll than a lot of people realize having never, you know, if you've never done it, like it's, it can get very real, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even, even locally, like nationals, um, there's a time zone change for us going to um where are we going scottsdale scottsdale, <laughs> scottsdale. uh so there's that time zone difference which for us i think will mostly work in our favor um but sometimes you can go the reverse direction and it works against you mm -hmm. so there's also that where all of a sudden you know you've been used to lifting at 4 p.m and now you're in the 8 a.m flight but you're also a.m 8 a.m going from pacific to um eastern yeah that's going to make a huge difference yeah for me flying east always makes the jet lag worse so i can fly west and life is good but as soon as i fly east like it's mm -hmm. it's all bad yeah we'll just stay up late and then it'll make it better on yeah. the way back mm -hmm. yeah it's fine <laughs> is the islands um in your time zone i can't remember what time zone is. i don't think it is it's I either it's either ours or it's an hour earlier. Oh. I know. I just know um, for me, like I was looking at all the flights and I was like, why do they have six hour layovers? And I realized it was actually like much later because I thought it was going to be like, you know, in the middle, like relative to the middle of the country. And so I thought it would only be like one or two hours and now it's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, I heard the flights okay. from like are bad anyway. Like there's there are still long layovers, like not six hours, but they're still long, and and it's it's a bit of a haul. Yeah. So Caymans is EST, just so you oh. know. Well, yay. <laughs> yeah, that's that was one of I was looking at that the other day. I was like, so I've got I've got a later flight so that I can work in the morning, and my flight leaves at five thirty, and then it gets to Arizona. At like 9 30 i think 8 30 or 9 30 which i'm like oh that's not bad like that's pretty yeah. early and then i but i'm taking a i forgot that i have a layover like somehow i missed that there was a layover because i was like oh it's only you know a three hour flight no it's not it's you've got to factor in time zones that you're in layovers and it's yeah. a short layover but um so i'm like oh yeah i forgot it's gonna be tiring yeah 
So, so what are you most looking forward to for Scottsdale? I don't know if that's. Is that for me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, so I'm looking I mean, other than hanging out with me, of course. No, probably, there's right. that. High on my list if I don't have a panic attack for it. Uh, I, I think it's getting back on the platform, right? Like I don't, I used to mm -hmm. compete often um, and I haven't, I've really only been doing like once or twice a year. Um, so it's nice to like kind of shake the cobwebs off. You know, we already talked about it. Like I really want to have a squat competition and be like, okay, cool. This is cool. You're not going to die because I do enjoy mm -hmm. catastrophe. Uh, so <laughs> like getting that in there and be like, yep, okay, we're cool. It's healed. Everything's fine. You know, you still know how to do this. Um, and aside from like the, the meat experience, you know, hopefully some PRs, hopefully some records, you, I don't get to see everybody, right? This is one of the cool things about going to nationals, whether it's masters or open or whatever, is there are people you don't get to hang out with very often. Like that was, I think one of the, the real bummer, I mean, aside from all the other bummers about COVID was all of my lifting friends that live in other parts of the country that I didn't get to see. Um, so, and where else do you find that many people who really just want to lift, talk about lifting and then go eat things? <laughs> um, cause that, that really is your community. And, and I don't, for most of us, I don't think that we have enough other lifters around us that we can just geek out on this stuff all the time like they're just not there for us like i train with a bunch of crossfitters like getting them to give me bench commands causes them to like sort of panic <laughs> <laughs> i saw that the other day yeah yeah like this is and this is a normal thing they're like oh, i don't want to want to mess you up and i was like well, i'm gonna blame you but it's probably gonna be my fault <laughs> you know i was like they're longer instead of shorter yes <laughs> but they never do <laughs> so um so yeah, I think I think that's really what it is, like getting getting to see everybody. I'm I'm looking forward to the general assembly. I'm I'm hearing there's gonna be a, a pretty decent QA session. So for everybody who's going, um come to the general assembly. Come and 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 listen to the governance. Like it, again, because we're a small organization right now, like I feel like the members have the best opportunity they've ever had to help chart the direction of our federation. Mm -hmm. Obviously there's some things that can't change. Like we are still beholden to all the IPF rules, right? So it's not like, oh, I want to change. I'm going to start, you know, deadlifting shirtless. That's not going to be a thing because IPF says it's not going to be a thing. But there's a ton of other stuff that we have the latitude to impact um, as far as like overall lifter experience. So, um, and we want to hear about it. We want to know what's on people's minds. We want to know like if there's stuff that's not going well, like let's, let's talk about it and see if we can find a solution. Um, so, you know, come to the meeting and, and be, be a part of the Federation, be a part of how we, how we go forward. And that Saturday night at what time? Eight. I, yeah, I know. And I, I've already, I've already heard people like, they're, they're like, that's past my bedtime. Like, yeah, I, I know. Um, I do think, especially now, um, I don't think it's going to go on for like nine hours. I hope not. Um, <laughs> um, um, and I don't know that there's there's a better time to do stuff, right? As packed as the weekend is. Um, but yeah. Oh, this, no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but come get your questions in, right? Even if you don't get the answer that you want. And I, I did this last year and, and I, I had people making faces at me. Like I asked questions I didn't expect anyone to have answers to. I just wanted to plant that seed. Because the fact that I asked the question calls people to think about stuff. So, um, and it's, it's always, it's always good food for thought, right? Like, like what is the membership thinking? Where are, what are their specific concerns? Like what, what can we do? And we don't, we don't know. The board doesn't know if nobody's talking to them. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you're right. The fact that it's small means that you can have those conversations with the board. Um, yeah, we, we have a chance here to, to kind of um, right the, the wrongs that we can fix that, you know, we're maybe present in um, USAPL before the split. Um, and also, you know, 
voice our opinions about how we want things to be. So I think like anybody who has come over from USAPL um, and you know wants to see things turn out substantially differently, you know, definitely come to that meeting because yeah. we're, listening. we're, you know, we're all listening and we want we want input. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, definitely. And it doesn't mean that everybody's going to get what they want, right? Like that's goes back to the, you know, I want to be able to deadlift shirtless. Like some things are just not going to happen, but it doesn't mean that, that we're not listening. And it doesn't mean that, that where it makes sense and where we're not, you know, breaking rules that we can't have improvements. Yeah. All right. So Julia just sent me some quick hitter questions for you. Okay. To wrap up. All right. Um, so what is your day job? So my day job is I am a, a program manager for a satellite communications company. Okay. And you just changed, right? Like a couple of months I, ago. Yeah. I mean, back and forth, but this is generally what I've been doing. I started off as a, as a technician and an engineer and I became a PM because I didn't know when to shut up. Uh, so that's what happens. Like, like you have too many opinions. So then they put you in charge of things. <laughs> so sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where do you train? You said CrossFit. I do. I, so I trained at CrossFit BWI um, and I've been there, God, I've been there like 10 years. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome that they support you in doing not CrossFit there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where did you grow up? We already went through this a little bit, but. Uh, everywhere. So I was born everywhere. in Germany um, over the course of my childhood, Kentucky, Colorado, Kansas, multiple turns in Texas, Germany, I think that's everywhere <laughs> as a child. Uh, did you do sports growing up? I did no. not. No, I am. I am terrible. I was always the heavy kid as soon as you're like, and, and when I was a teenager, right? Like what was, what sports did you have for girls? Volleyball, softball, and track. None of those things are good for me. Nope. Not if we want to win. I'm happy to play. Just don't get competitive because I'm, I am a detriment. <laughs> yeah, I did track or I was a jumper. Uh, long jumper, triple jumper. And people ask me about it sometimes. I'm like, no, no, no. I just did triple jump because there were usually only three competitors. So you get third place and still get team points. That was it. I was not good. When you're not powerlifting, what is your idea of a good time? Oh, it depends. Um, I, I like food. I mean, super. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah. <I'm> <laughs> Uh, we have a, a, a friend group that like once a quarter or so picks a weird restaurant, preferably someplace we haven't eaten or cuisine we haven't tried. Um, and we just go order everything that we can find and like sample everything um, just for the experience of it. So um, so that's the thing. Um, Renaissance Festival here is in the fall. Like there's, you know, hardcore geek there. Let's we'll go go be a Rennie. Um, and then I think just, just hanging out, like I spend a lot of time at the gym, not because I'm lifting, but because there are people there that I like. <laughs> yeah. That's the one thing about CrossFit culture that I definitely miss is like the hangout time. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Uh, how old are you? You've talked about this. Yep. Yeah, I'll be 45. Five. Uh, do you prefer mountains or beaches? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I mean, so gen generally speaking, I'm an indoor cat. Um, <laughs> so as soon as there's bugs and too much sun, like I'm, I'm real pale, I will burst into flames. Um, but I just like, I, I like the experience of it. Right. So it's different than my normal life. So I, I want to go do it, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, do you have a nickname? Uh, just, I mean, Mel, that's, yeah. We'll think of one. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I called you Melissa one day to Bill and Bill was like, oh, you be Mel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> really, I'm pretty well trained. Like I answered to just about everything. The only thing that's like, and I'm, I shouldn't say this out loud because somebody's going to weaponize this, but like the only thing that is like not on the table is Missy. That is not a thing ever. Um, I will. Yeah. I think I confuse him because he's got Melissa Forbes too. And so I was like, Melissa, oh. Melissa. Yeah. And then he's like, yeah. oh, you mean Mel? I was like, yeah. Yeah. 
So who is a person you look up to in powerlifting? So do a bad job with this because I don't fangirl, right? Like, like people are people. And there, there are definitely people that, that I think they do amazing things. Like watching Banika squat is incredible, right? Mm -hmm. Watching talk jump off her shoulders at the Sheffield was like crazy to watch. Um, but I, <sighs> I feel like generally speaking, the people I admire are giving back to the sport. They have longevity They're um, because none of us get to lift unless people volunteer, right? That, that is thousand percent mm -hmm. works. So I can appreciate people who are amazingly strong, but I think the people that I, I respect the most are the people that are also trying to give back to the sport that they're not taking more out of it than what they're putting into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That goes back to, I think everyone should have to spot and load at least once. Yeah. Um, I would say once a year, but I'm not, I'm not, so <laughs> I'm not going to put that on someone else. Um, uh, what's your favorite sport to watch? They're probably strength sports. It's probably powerlifting and CrossFit and strongman. Mm -hmm. um, I watch a lot of baseball because I live with a baseball person. It's not a choice. It's just a thing that happens. Um, I have more appreciation. I like weight. I actually, I really like weightlifting when I can find it because it's hard. And if you've never tried to weightlift, it is insanely hard and it's beautiful when they do it properly. Mm -hmm. And small changes make a difference, which is what makes it exciting huge. We had our only coach at one point, like I missed a clean badly. I like bounced it off my throat and like drama ensued. And he came over and he's like, I'm so glad that you found powerlifting and you're good at it and you love it because you are so awful at this. And I'm like, <laughs> like, you're not wrong, but that's real rude. And, and so he hugged me cause he felt bad. <laughs> Some of my closest friends are very, um, one of my, one of my absolute closest friends is very elite and weightlifting. Um, not quite Olympic level, but like was in the international pool is in the international pool and I will go to any meet that she runs just to watch yeah. it because it's so much fun to watch yeah. yeah it's amazing uh music music that is playing in your headphones during a meet and what music is like in your car when you're just riding down the road there are no there are no headphones at a meet um I okay. hate being able to hear what's going on around me it freaks me out um so, um, so that's never a thing. <laughs> um, in my car, there's a lot of country, um, but there's a lot of everything, right? Like I have, like, because of Pandora and I like stuff and then I just get weird random stuff in my playlist. Um, and somebody, some poor soul that had to drive to Columbus with me for the Arnolds and got victimized by my playlist is like, I don't understand how you can have Eminem and then George Strait. I have questions about this. And I was like, I need you to just go with it. <laughs> was that my coach? Cause <laughs> it was no. no. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, movie genres. Probably mostly action. Um, honestly, anything except horror. Like if it looks like it has an interesting premise, I'm here for it. Um, as soon as it's scary, I'm not going to watch it. I have an overactive imagination and I have incredibly vivid dreams and my imagination does not need encouragement. Nope. <laughs> All right. So anyone you'd like to thank, um, you don't have sponsors, right? Or do you? No sponsors but if anybody would like to like throw me some sponsorship i am here for it and i will love you forever um i'm a terrible spokesperson though so um um so chris aiden because he's been my coach now for like five or six years and has not fired me in spite of all of my assorted shenanigans or the fact that i called him a mean little man um so uh Everybody at CrossFit BWI who heckles usually because that's how we show love. Apparently, like there's a lot of smack talk there. Um, and and for having an open gym area where the answer is, if you, even though you're a powerlifter, we won't judge you. <laughs> um, uh, 
and, and then probably honestly all of my teammates for for every year that I've I've competed at like an international meet like like I've met a lot of really amazing people who you know they'll loan you gear and they'll rub your legs and <laughs> buy you drinks and they they will you know like it is really cool even though powerlifting is is an individual sport it is really cool to have that team feeling where everybody's looking out for each other um and it makes it makes that experience that much more fun Oh, cool. Julia, do you have any other wrap up questions, thoughts? Um, no, um, I guess um, you, you know, you briefly touched on your role um, it, within Powerlifting America. Do you uh, want to expand a little on that or anything? I mean, I think, I think largely the athlete committee is still kind of trying to like sort out where we belong. So other than to just like reiterate, we are a resource for the athletes. We are here to help you get information and, and understand processes and bring up problems. Um, like, you know, there, there is other process for like complaints and like, hopefully nobody's actually having to do that stuff, but if they do, right. Um, like, if, if you don't know how to know, know how to navigate a process, right? Like the athlete committee is here to help for that. If, if you think there's a systemic problem, um, you know, we really are just a resource. Um, we want to be able to, to take the feelings of our membership and our athletes to the board and to the EC and, and get resolution of some kind. Um, and and we're a little bit looking for like what are those what are those things right like we as athletes have thoughts on what things need need to be worked on but um certainly we don't know everything there is i will say this and it's going to come up at the at the general assembly as well um we are intending to put out an athlete athlete experience survey um sometime after nationals like we've we've got to get it drafted and and approved and all of that but um it is our intention is for it to be very broad reaching and to really be able to talk about everyone's experience, you know, both national team members and I don't, I don't want to call them recreational lifters because I don't want to I don't want to minimize what they do because they are a large part of our membership. But like the folks that are doing local meets, that that local community as well, because we want everyone to have good experiences wherever they're competing at. Well, um, I guess that'll do it. Um, good luck to you um, at nationals. It's coming up. It's I think it's a week and a half. Yeah, that it's like just shy of two weeks. Let's not shorten. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like thirteen days. Thirteen. Yeah, probably. But who's counting? Nobody's counting. But yeah, I'm counting. I am <laughs> counting every day. <laughs> I need every last one of those days. So, I mean, good luck to both you guys. Um, you're competing, Melissa, on on Saturday, and um, Amy, you're Friday. competing. We're Friday. No, Friday. We're, we're Friday session three. Friday they put all all the M one women are mm -mm. session. So, I so can't session, remember. session three is all the masters seventy six and above. Okay. Okay, so which uh, I giant mass exodus from the seventy six class. So <laughs> what? I heard there was a mass exodus from the seventy six class last night. Oh, was there really? At least for the M twos, there was. Ooh. Oh, M twos. I, I don't know. If, I, don't, I haven't looked today, so I don't know how. I how don't many, either. But yeah, that eighty four class got real big. <laughs> oh, interesting. Maybe Bill changed my weight class without telling me. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually something he would do <laughs> actually he went he went he would talk to me first but all right so we'll catch you live um on friday session three um yep all right sounds good that's a wrap right, okay see. thank you